Bauman. I'm assistant professor of religious studies here at FIU and also an honors fellow in the, sorry, uh, a faculty fellow in the Honors College and the director of the program in the study of spirituality. Um, and tonight this lecture is um, sponsored by, it's part of a series on food and the humanities that the Center, Center for the Humanities in an Urban Environment is putting on this year. So it's part of a whole series. Um, it's co-sponsored by a number of organizations, including the FIU Alumni Association, because we have with us a distinguished alumni of FIU, um, WPB2, uh, WPBT2, who is filming this. So this lecture will appear um, on the Center for Humanities and the Urban Environment website at a later date. There'll be links to it as all of the, center, uh, the center's uh, programs are, uh, can be found there. It's also sponsored by the um, Exile Studies Program in the Department of English, the Latin American and Caribbean Center, at LAC, here at FIU, the Cuban Research Institute, um, and uh, the uh, Religious Studies Department uh, of Florida International University. So we have a lot of co-sponsors for this evening's event. Um, I think that's all I want to say. There's a few uh, uh, flyers and things um, on the table on the way out if you'd like to see, uh, learn more about some of the events uh, that the Center for Humanities and Urban Environment is putting on uh, later this year. So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I know you have lots of competing uh, competing uh, things to do, so thanks for coming to the lecture this evening. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce um, uh, Professor De La Torre because we met um, a couple years ago. Uh, we were both in Indonesia, happened to be at the same place, and that's where we met, in Indonesia. <laughs> and since then, we've, uh, we've uh, had the privilege to work on um, uh, a committee together at the Academy of Religion, which is the professional uh, organization of about 10,000 religious scholars from all over the world. I've gotten the privilege to, to work um, with Pak Miguel, as I like to call him. Pak is a, is a sort of uh, a term of uh, respect for uh, your elders in Indonesia. <laughs> he is called the old one. <laughs> so um, it's, it's my privilege to, to host um, uh, Professor De La Torre here tonight. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about him and why I think he's uh, such a unique fit and will be so interesting to many of you. Um, he was born in Cuba a month before the Castro Revolution. Uh, his family came to the United States as refugees when he was six months old. Right? For a while, the U.S. government considered him an illegal immigrant. He attended Blessed Sacrament School in Queens, New York, and was and confirmed by the Catholic Church. <clears throat> Meanwhile, his parents were devotees and priests, priestesses of the religion of Santeria. Right? Uh, de la Torre's early childhood was marked by a spiritual hybridity based on his Catholic and Santeria faiths and upbringing. He left Queens, moving to Miami, Florida, in his teens. Right? So he is a Yamian uh, here on this, back home again. He uh, received his BS from FU. I, I don't know what year, and uh, you can choose to divulge that if you'd like to. Um, and then went on to get um, a master's in public administration from American University, an MDiv from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and an MA and PhD from Temple University. Um, also, uh, in between all that time, he uh, was a candidate for the Florida House of Representatives in District 115 um, as a Republican. Um, <laughs> he's had some conversion experiences maybe between now and then, I'm not sure, um, <clears throat> so, uh, that have changed his political views a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so a few, he's written uh, so many books, I can't possibly tell you all about them, but I want to give you a little anecdote um, about uh, his type of scholarship and writing. So he taught Christian ethics at Hope College in Holland, Michigan from 1999 to 2005. In 2005, he wrote a column for the local newspaper, The Holland Centennial, titled, When the Bible is Used for Hatred. Um, the article was a satirical piece commenting on the focus on the family's James Dobson, outlining <coughs> of SpongeBob SquarePants. A few days later, uh, Mr. Dobson responded to the article. Due to various circumstances arising from the encounter, um, he resigned from his tenure, <laughs> and since then has been serving as the Associate Professor of Social Ethics at Iowa School of Theology in Denver, Col Colorado, and now he's a full professor there. Um, his many books include, and I'm just going to name a few of their names, many books, articles, publications, these are the types of things he writes about, um, Liberation Theology for Armchair Theologians, Ethics, A Liberative Approach, uh, some of the titles I like, The Quest for the Historical Satan, 
I have this book in my office. It's, it's very fun. Um, Satan is kind of a, a trickster figure almost. Um, Latina, uh, Latina, Latino, social ethics, moving beyond Eurocentric moral thinking. Out of the shadows into the light, Christianity and homosexuality. A lily among the thorns, imagining a new Christian sexuality. So he's written on everything from sort of biblical ethics to liberation ethics to um, ethics of economics and ethics, sexuality and ethics, all these sorts of things. He was also the, the president of the Society for uh, Christian Ethics uh, uh, recently. So it's my pleasure to have him here uh, talking to you tonight about a new project he's working on that has to do with issues of food and justice. So please join me and welcome me, Dr. Uh, Miguel de la Torre. Buenas noches. It is so great to be back in Miami, having a poco frijoles negros, platano maduros. They just don't have that in Denver, Colorado, to the extent and to the perfection that they have it here in Miami. Uh, however, I want to begin by basically making it clear that I am a born again, dairy-free, pescatarian. Not Episcopalian, pescatarian. That means that I do not eat any dairy, and I do not eat, I mean, I do not eat any meat, chicken, I, I sometimes eat fish. Now the reason that I'm doing this is about five years ago, I was weighing 270 pounds and pre-diabetic. And the doctor said I had to change my lifestyle, which I did. Uh, now I do P90X, I watch what I eat, um, and I'm at the best health I've ever been in my life. So my eating habits changed mostly for health reasons. But as an ethicist, after I changed how I eat, I began to wonder how food operates in the globalization of the economy, and specifically how food can oppress people. So the book that I am working on now um, is a book on ethics dealing with three items um, that we normally take for granted, sugar, bananas, and corn. So I'm doing a historical analysis of these three food items, and I'm, com and I'm connecting it to economic structures that create oppression for the vast majority of the world's poor. So with sugar, I uh, basically am concentrating on Cuba, and I'm looking at the rise of slavery and the, and, and, and the reason why we had colonialism. With um, bananas, I'm looking at the rise of the American empire and how the United, and how the United States basically created um, economic oppression throughout Central America uh, and the Caribbean. And with uh, corn, I'm looking at NAFTA and I'm looking at uh, the, the spread of neoliberalism that is destroying, I believe, um, um, the world economy. So those are the three food items. I was going to have a chapter on fish and I was going to have a chapter on coffee and a chapter on chocolate, but after I wrote the first chapter, it was like 60 pages, and I didn't think a publisher would have wanted 12 chapters of 50 or 60 pages each, so I narrowed it down to these three things. Um, there's many ways we could look at food. I mean, I could talk about why eating meat is horrible, how it destroys your body. I could talk about how um, to create grazing land, like you know, 40% of uh, Costa Rica's forest has been decimated so that cows can, can, you know, can graze. I could talk about the, the, the biodiversity that is being lost because of the large numbers of herds, but I'm not going to do that. I just mentioned it, but I'm not going to do that. Um, instead, and there's a lot of good books out there, and a lot of great documentaries that deal with that. My interest is on political ethics and economic ethics, and, and that's what I want to focus on. So let's begin with sugar, a little bit of history. Sugar is first domesticated in Indonesia. And from Indonesia, it moves to China, in where they begin the process of learning how to uh, domesticate, from the domesticated sugar cane, how to make actual sugar by boiling it. And they notice that a certain rim goes on top of the pot, and then that becomes the sugar crystal. Uh, from there, it goes to the, Middle, uh, to the Middle East, 
uh, what is now the Middle East, um, we find references of sugar in the book of Isaiah, uh, a couple of passages to it. Uh, when it was in China, we find uh, references uh, to it in Buddhism. So it, it's been around. Now, while in the Middle East, during the Crusades, the Europeans find this sugar and they take it back to Europe. And it becomes a crop. But the problem with sugar is highly intense labor. So usually sugar plantations were very small, made very little sugar, very, very expensive. It was basically um, only for the kings and queens of Europe and the nobility to eat because it was just way too expensive. Couple of dates, and I think this is important. By 1419, the Portuguese discover an island called Madeira off of, of Africa, west of Africa. By 1420, they settled this uninhabited island. By 1432, just a decade later, they established the first sugar plantation. Now, now what's important about that is that this is a tremendously large plantation, moving away from the model of just having these small farms. By 1451, the church religiously justifies slave work on plantation. So the church says that it is okay, it is not unethical, it is not immoral to have slaves. By 18, I'm sorry, by 1480, the Spanish begins to also plant plantations on the Canary Islands and in Saint Domingue. By 1493, a year after Columbus sails the ocean blue and is discovered by native people, a year later, the first sugar plantation is built in Hispaniola, which is today Santo Domingo, um, Haiti. By 1502, sugar plantation slaves, the first slaves are brought to Cuba to work these plantations. So, I mean, again, look at the dates from 1492, 1502, just a decade later, we already have sugar plantations going with slaves upon it. Now, um, um, Botanius de las Casas, which is called the defender of the Indians, um, sees the horror that is being done to the Indian who are working on the land. So he petitions to eliminate what is called a ecumienda. The ecumienda was we good Christian conquistadores, out of our love for the, these poor infidels, we're going to teach them about Jesus um, and get them converted. And in the process, as their way of repaying us, they could work out sugar canes and they could work for us. So this was kind of like the way that Comienda worked. Uh, but the slaves were being horribly treated. Um, so what De Las Casas, the defender of the Indians, says is, tell you what, Let's stop the slaughter of the indigenous people and instead bring in black slaves to work the plantations instead of the Indians, which is one thing he regretted for the rest of his life. But because of that, you begin to really develop all these plantations in the Caribbean. And the Caribbean at that time is known as the Sugar Islands because that is where that industry takes off. And what ends up happening in Europe is that the price of sugar begins to drop, more people can afford sugar. Now in 1491, Haiti has a revolution. Uh, the African slaves rebel, they kill everybody, uh, well, almost everybody who's white, and they're slave owners. Um, and at that point, Cuba becomes the sugar bowl of the world, literally. Now, one of the reasons Haiti was unable to develop economically is because at the time, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was the president, the last thing he ever wanted was to see a country run by former African slaves that would succeed. So everything that the United States can do was done to make sure that Haiti was a failed republic. And the United States was very successful in doing that. And one of the consequences today, of course, is Haiti when you want to poison nations in the Western Hemisphere. So Cuba now becomes basically the sugar bowl of the world. Um, most slaves come to Cuba, have an average life expectancy of seven years. It was cheaper to work a slave to death than to actually take care of their health um, or to provide any type of assistance. Unlike the United States, where slavery becomes a cottage industry, where the idea is you want to have, uh, you, know, you want to produce your own slaves here. 
Um, in the United States, a slave plantation, uh, growing tobacco, probably had a family or two families working. Cuba, the Caribbean, because we're talking about sugar plantations, it is high intensity labor and you literally have thousands of slaves working a plantation. Mostly men, very few women. So, let's jump forward real fast, because I, I don't want to spend too much time on the history, but I, I need to give you that background to really connect the rise of colonialism, the rise of slavery, with the production of sugar. And, and that connection's important. Um, Cuba goes through three revolutions. Um, the, third revo the third one is the charm, 1895. Um, but until then, before the revolution, the United States always really coveted Cuba. John Adams has said, um, wrote at one time that we could see Cuba from our shores and like an apple falling from a tree, it would only gravitate towards us. And throughout the history of the United States, there were many attempts to try to acquire Cuba as part of the United States. In fact, we came very close uh, right before the Civil War, when a lot of the Cuban planters wanted to join the United States because, you know, they wanted to be part of the South and therefore slavery would have been protected. But the United States said no because that would have been one more slave state and that would have destroyed the balance of power in Congress. So Cuba never becomes a state after the Civil War. Uh, then Cuba planters want nothing to do with the United States because slavery continues in Cuba till 1886. Now, Third uh, war for revolution, Jose Mati leads the charge, he's killed in battle. Um, basically, um, as the, right before the war really takes off, in New York City, in the Cosmopolitan Club, uh, four individuals gather. Uh, Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, John Dewey, the Admiral, Admiral of the Navy, of, uh, the Navy um, Jeffrey Mahan, who was a famous writer, and the fourth person was, Ooh, I'm kind of freeze brain right now. I'll come back to him. I'll, I'll come back to him. They're sitting, oh, um, Lodge, uh, Cabot Lodge, the Senator. Senator Lodge. They're sitting around the table talking about we need to become an empire. And that's, you know, the problem with the United States, we're not an empire. You have all these other countries who are dividing the world. In the 1886, when the European powers divide Africa among themselves, we don't have any empires. Our armies and our navies are basically from the Civil War. I mean, we don't have anything modern. Um, we, need a, we need to develop an empire. So Spanish Empire is crashing. Cuba is fighting for its independence. Um, Spain tries to sell Cuba to McKinley. He says, no, thank you. Um, and instead, what happens is um, we enter the war after the main explosion of Havana Harbor. Uh, we blame the Spaniards. Uh, the problem with that is that when the main, the main explodes, the explosion comes from the inside outward, as, uh, instead of from the outward inward, so it was an inside explosion. Boilers used to blow up during that time and these warships uh, of that era. So we enter the war, Theodore Roosevelt goes up some hill called San Juan, he has a great publicity. Nothing, you know, nothing really helped win the war, but the war is won anyway. Now, here's the important thing. In Santiago de Cuba, which is the port from where the Spaniards leave, and you, know, the, and, and, and you have what you call the ceremony of the flag, and where the flag of the colonizer comes down and the flag of the new republic goes up, okay? that day, the Spanish flag goes down. No Cuban who fought in the Cuban, in the Cuban War for Independence is allowed to enter Santiago de Cuba. So what happens is the Spanish flag goes down, the U.S. flag goes up. And the war for Cuban independence becomes the Spanish-American War, where Cuba is basically left out of the equation. And basically, Cuba becomes an economic vassal of the United States um, for the longest time. Now, since the war, okay, ends in 1895, 1905, so we're talking about 10 years later, 60% of all the rural land is owned by American interests. So basically, the sugar plantations, the land is owned by U.S. All the railroads to take the sugar from the land to the port is owned by U.S. interests. The ports are owned by U.S. interests. The, um, the, um, the oil, 50% is owned by the United States, 25 by British, the other 25 by Dutch. The nickel, all the nickel, which is Cuba's major mineral, is owned by the United States. Okay. So you have this transfer of wealth 
that begins to occur. To make matters worse, the United States imposes, uh, Q, uh, uh, agrees to take out the military from Cuba if Cuba adds the Platt Amendment to its constitution. And the Platt Amendment basically said that uh, the United States can intervene in Cuban affairs whenever it wants to, that the United States reserve the right to have a naval base if they want to on the island, hence Guantanamo, and that the United States also goes ahead and um, uh, can, uh, Cuba cannot sign any treaty with any other country that does not give equal rights to the United States. So for all practical purposes, Cuba was part of the U.S. economy. Now, even though Cuba had the highest GPA among Latin, Latin American nations, when you compare it to the U.S., it was half of Mississippi, which was the poorest state in the United States. So it was great poverty for a lot of people, but a lot of wealth uh, for, for, for a certain elite. Now, what's important is, when Castro has his revolution in 59, one of the first things he says when he enters Havana is, this time, no one's going to prevent us from entering into Santiago. So we're referring to the, what, what happened um, when the Spanish-American War ended. Now, um, regardless of, of, of what he wants to say, one of the things that I would always argue is that Castro becomes a Marxist after the Bay of Pigs, not before. Now, yes, Raul Castro was part of the youth, communist youth, and so was Che Guevara and that. But Castro himself, I believe, really becomes Marxist when, you know, after Bay of Pigs and after uh, the, Gold, uh, the Cold War to keep things. So I argue that basically the Castro Revolution was more a third world revolution than anything else. Now, I want to pause there for a few seconds, okay? And I want to jump to bananas, okay? Um, and, 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 so, so, and again, bananas, okay, bananas. Bananas are first domesticated in what is Central America. That's the first place where we see fossils of bananas. Uh, I'm sorry, miento, miento, no, 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 that's corn. Forget what I just said. Bananas. Bananas are first domesticated in Indonesia. Okay. They also make their way westward. But unlike sugar, what the problem with bananas is that when you took the crop from Indonesia and planted it in Central America, the environment and, and you know, the, the, the soil was not good for bananas. And you developed this, this type of banana um, illness that would kill crops. Now, the reason it's important is because the banana company needed a lot of land. Because when they planted a banana plantation, within a few years, that will die out because of, 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 the, of, uh, of this foreign crop in the, dirt, in the soil, and they would need a whole new plot of land to plant a whole new plantation. Matter of fact, the bananas that we eat today are new bananas. Um, th that, that whole strain of bananas pretty much died out in the 1970s. So what we eat today is not the bananas that your grandparents ate. Um, now, I say all this because in 1870, these two individuals by the name of Baker and Keith um, basically begin to bring bananas to the United States. Bananas first appeared in the United States during the, um, the 1876 World Fair where they sold it for a nickel in a little tin foil uh, for just a little slice of it. And basically people loved it. But the problem with bananas is that they would rot before they get to U.S. ports because of the long distance. Um, but then as steamboats begin to, you know, begin to be developed and boats could go faster and refrigeration is now added to boats, bananas could not last. So these two individuals who began to introduce the United States to bananas, Baker and Keith, form a company known as United Fruit Company out of Boston. By 1899, 16 mil uh, million bushels of bananas are being sold in the United States. Literally, Americans went bananas over bananas. I couldn't use that, I'm sorry. So, let's look at Guatemala, for example. In 1901, uh, the dictator, Estrada Cabrera, gives full reign to the United Fruit Company to basically develop the banana industry there. In return, the United Fruit Company built the railroads, built the, interest, the infrastructure for the country. The country thought, uh, at least the dictator, wanted to build the infrastructure to modernize Guatemala, and in return, they had free reigns. Okay. Um, whenever a country in Latin America were, went against the interests of the United Fruit Company, 
basically the U.S. Marines would land to overthrow that government and create a new one. Hence the term Banana Republic. That's where the term comes from. These were republics created to protect banana interests. Um, just to give you an example, all the countries along the Caribbean, uh, that border on the Caribbean, um, 21 were invaded by U.S. Marines to overthrow the government. 26 were covert operation in the last century alone. So you got to think, 47 times we did regime change before regime change became popular in this century. Okay, so Gabriela, the dictator, okay, uh, gunboat diplomacy is something that Theodore Roosevelt gives us, which basically is we will use our gunboat to protect U.S. business interests. Speak softly, carry a big stick. That's what all that meant. Nothing could ever occur in any of these countries without the express blessings of the U.S. ambassador, who was the most powerful man in that country, regardless of where the dictator happens to be. Um, by the 1950, in Guatemala, 70% of the land was controlled by 2.2% of the population. 90% of the population had control of 10% of the land, and that 90% was mostly indigenous people. So Jacobo, Jacobo Abenez is elected in a free and open election okay, to be the president. And he decides to bring modest land reform. He says, we will go ahead and buy the land that the United Fruit Company owns at whatever the United Fruit Company said the land was worth for tax purposes. Unfortunately, the, land, the United Fruit Company devalued the value of the land uh, to pay less taxes. So now they were willing to pay him what they said it was worth, which was a lot less than what it was really worth. Now, the United Fruit Company did not like this, so they went to Eisenhower. Eisenhower, when he becomes president, up to that time, um, the CIA, which is a fairly new organization that comes out of the Second World War, only gathers intelligence. Under the Truman administration, the CIA was a, an intelligence gathering organization. But in Iran, in 1953, um, basically they kick out the British and they take over the oil fields, the people do. Um, the British don't like that, they're no longer the world empire, so somewhere in the White House, I think there was a passing of the baton, and the United States steps in and gets rid of and overthrows the democratically elected government of Iran. If you want to understand why we're having problems with Iran, you have to go to 1953 and really see that what really begins all this is when we overthrew the democratically elected government and installed the shock. Okay. Now this is 53. By, it was such a success that they decided to do the same thing in Guatemala in 56. So in, uh, what they do is uh, you have two brothers, the Dulles brothers, one's the head of the CIA. Um, Allen is the head of the CIA, and John Faust is the head of the, is the Secretary of State. Um, what they do, um, oh, interesting, John Foster used to be the attorney for the United Fruit Company. And Allen Dulles uh, also worked as an attorney at large for the United Fruit Company. They hire a publicity media company to begin to disseminate stories in our local newspaper that Abenez is a communist. That always works. So he's a communist. People get all wild up. Um, they develop a fake army of you know, ex Guatemala military folks who didn't really fight any battles. They could sit in the border someplace to overthrow the government. Finally, the government um, is overthrown by the head of the you know, CIA, basically helped overthrow it. And what's interesting is that the person in the, second, in the State Department who coordinating this, um, this overthrow of the Guatemala government, um, when he quits the State Department and becomes the next president of the United Fruit Company. Since 56, about 300,000 Guatemalans are killed and disappeared in the aftermath of a 30 year civil war of US involvement in Guatemala. This is basically all based on this pseudo religious ideology known as Manifest Destiny, which you might have read back in high school, and if you remember it correctly, 
God gave us this land as our new Jerusalem, as our new Israel. It is God's manifest destiny that we occupy this land. Basically, uh, gumbo diplomacy takes it beyond the continental United States to all these other countries. In World War before we try to occupy land, since the Spanish-American War, we begin to try to occupy or control economies of other countries. So hold on to corn. We're holding on to sugar. Let's jump into, I'm sorry, bananas, sugar. Let's jump into corn. Manifest destiny. What that meant is that 50% of Mexico becomes the United States. Um, we have this uh, Mexican-American War in the 1830s. Um, James Polk is running for president, and he says, if I'm elected president, I will invade Mexico. He is elected president. Two months later, he invades Mexico. Okay? Um, he invades Mexico, um, and the outcome of the war is half of Mexico becomes the United States. But the important half, with all the gold of California, all the oil of Texas, all the copper of Arizona, all the silver of Nevada, all the major minerals and oil that the land has becomes part of the United States and becomes the seed money for the rise of the U.S. economy. That's very important. And then the Mexicans who own land uh, according to the Treaty of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo, they were supposed to keep their land titles. All that was taken away from them. So as the Mexicans like to tell us, they didn't cross no stinking borders. The borders crossed them. Um, when, the, when, when, when Polk asked for the declaration of war from Congress, John Quincy Adams, who used to be president, is now a member of the House of Representatives, stands up and says, I fear that today our nation's banners will be the banners of tyranny for what we're about to do to Mexico. Ulysses S. Grant, who fights in that war as a lieutenant, in his memoirs in the 1880s as he's dying of throat cancer, he writes, um, just as God Almighty punishes individuals, so too does God punish nations. And I fear that the Civil War was God's punishment upon us for what we did to Mexico. Now I say this because when Secretary of State Colin Powell was uh, talking about going to war of Iraq, he said, you know, we're a nation that never invades another people to take away their land, but we just asked for enough land to bury our dead, to which the Mexican ambassadors cracked up laughing. But that's not fine. Okay. So we could probably say, well, that was back then. Thank God we don't do that anymore. Okay. Let's talk about corn and NAFTA. Corn. First domesticated in Central America. We, corn is the miracle crop. It grows in high altitude, low altitude. Heavy rain, no rain. It grows anywhere. Um, it, from Central America, it spreads to North America and South America. When a lost Columbus is discovered by the native people, he takes the corn back to Europe and it spreads there. Corn feeds the people. In Native American spirituality, corn is one of the three sisters along with squash and beans. At the time, basically, a Mexican would grow enough corn. Uh, for one-third of it would feed his family and livestock. Two-thirds, they would sell at, sell at market and be able to survive um, a fairly nice existence. Then in 1994, we passed NAFTA. Okay. NAFTA. According to the World Bank, which has never been a friend of the poor, even the World Bank says that the greatest cause of world poverty today is the $1 billion a day spent to subsidize crops by industrial and developed nations. Okay? The U.S. subsidized corn in the United States to a tune of $41.9 billion during the first 10 years of NAFTA. The Mexicans subsidized corn to a total of zero, which means it is cheaper, if you're a Mexican farmer, to buy U.S. corn than to grow your own corn. Okay? So we should not be surprised that in the first years of NAFTA, 1.7 million Mexicans lose their, job, lose their farms because they cannot compete against U.S. grown corn. Uh, because of NAFTA, the prices of, 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 of bare essentials goes up by 247%. The price of tortillas goes up by 483%. 
and you can't grow enough food. Now, if you can't grow your corn, you end up then moving to the border, where you can work in the maquiladoras, the factories, and then as you work in the factory, you look out the window, you see the McDonald's, and you know that some pimple-faced kid is making more money in one hour than you make in a day. So we, they are being pushed out of Mexico and pulled into the United States. NAFTA pushes them out, we push them in. Now, we could probably say, I wish we would have known this before we signed NAFTA. Well, we did. The GAO, the Government Accounting Office, that studies every legislation for Congress, said in their 1993 report, the year before NAFTA, that if NAFTA is passed, our immigration situation will explode and become a crisis. Okay? So what do we do? Two months after we pass NAFTA, the Clinton administration, the Liberal Democrat, goes ahead and implements Operation Gatekeeper. Operation Gatekeeper closes and militarizes the border along the major cities. Before, if you basically, um, if you had a farm in Washington State, you go down to Tijuana, you put a newspaper in Spanish in the local Tijuana newspaper, and you say, looking for some people to work my farm, meet me at the Catholic Church across the border. You, crossed the, you walked across the border, got in the bus, went up north, and then you walked your way back south, and then crossed back to Mexico and did your own farm harvesting. And it was this free-flowing situation. During, before and after, the increase of, his, of Mexicans in this country really did not increase population-wise, because people would come, work, and go back. By militarizing the border, basically the migrants are now pushed into the desert, into the mountain area. And, and, and here's the sad thing. We call this a deterrence policy. Operation Gatekeeper basically says, we know people are going to die. But that's okay, because it would deter other people from crossing the borders. Okay. Not since the days of Jim Crow do we have a government policy that literally kills a certain group of people of color to prevent another group of people of color from doing the same thing. I would argue that what's going on the border right now is the greatest human rights crisis and, and human rights violations that are occurring in this country. I spend a lot of days on the border with food and water, and, and, and I, I, we don't have time to really begin to unpack them unless you ask questions, and I'll be happy to go there. So let me wrap everything up, because I'm really running overboard, and I apologize. Um, so what does all this have? Corn, sugar, um, um, bananas. Back to the book. June 21st, 1960, I received a letter from the Nationalization Office of this country that said that I was in violation of Section 242 of the Immigration Nationalization Act. In other words, I overstayed my tourist visa. And the government asked me to really self-deport. Um, so here's the question. Why did I come to this country? For some people, they would argue, I came looking for freedom. Other people would say, no, I came to use up all your social services uh, <laughs> and take advantage of you. Both of those answers are wrong. I am here in this country because of a century of U.S. policies in Latin America. If you've been sleeping up to now, wake up, because this is really the whole reason for this talk. When one country builds roads into another country for the purpose of taking its natural resources and its cheap labor, why should we be surprised that those people take those same roads following everything that has been stolen from them? I am here following my sugar, my tobacco, and my rum, the three essentials of life. <laughs> it's not that you need to show hospitality, because hospitality assumes you own the house, and out of the goodness of your heart, you're going to let me stay in your house. Our cheap labor and raw materials built this house, and we want our damn house back. So when we talk about issues like immigration, it's a lot more complex than people just wanting to cross the border to use up our social services. There is a history 
of U.S. actions in Latin America which is directly rooted to food and the food we eat. And, and that's where I really want to end this. I thank you so much for coming out here on the film today. <laughs> We do have time for questions, I, and I know that you have a lot. I'd love for you to say just a word about some of your work that you do on the board, just because I know about it, and I think yep. it's so unique, and it's, uh, it's uh, you take students there, and, yep. and, and so tell us a little bit about that work. Um, I work with several organizations. Uh, no More Deaf is one of them, um, Good Samaritans, uh, Border Links. Basically, what we do is we provide food and water on the trails um, as people are crossing. We believe it's, you know, our argument is, in the 1946 Nuremberg trial, um, uh, U.S. versus Gurdon, it was said that it that you know that saying "I don't know" is not an excuse. If people are dying, you have a moral obligation as a country to step in and defend the people who are dying. What we're saying, when I say this is the civil disobedience, like the civil rights movement, that's not what we're doing. We're doing civil initiative. We're saying that the U.S. is not living up to its to its treaty obligations and to its court decisions by, by taking care of people who are dying on the borders. So we go and we do it in the name of the U.S. government. Of course, the U.S. government doesn't like that approach. Um, and we've been detained and, 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 and harassed and a few other things. But our goal is to feed and provide food and water. And we don't ask people what papers they have or what papers they don't have. We don't care. I mean, we're just doing that terrible. work. My son, who's a filmmaker, um, and I are making a film about it, a documentary on uh, uh, police brutality or border patrol brutality. We have footage of border patrol be uh, beating people to death, literally, and shooting people. And that's part of the documentary, to try to raise the consciousness of the great human rights violations that are going on the border right now. It, it really is horrible. And, and you know... And I, and I double dog dare you, come to the border for yourself. Don't take my word for it. You know, and, and go and walk the trails for a while. Um, your life will be changed forever. Right. Well, I know that there's probably questions out there, so, yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, wonderful, wonderful section. But my question is, what's being done uh, to take care of the children in the border? They're caught in the crossfires of this terrible I mean, when you talk about the children, oh man. First of all, one of the things that we do in the United States when we deport people, we deport women and small children to border towns at like three in the morning when everything is closed, dangerous border towns. We deport the children and women at that time. You know, it's just, at one, one of the interviews that, I, that we did on the film, is a young girl who was deported like at 3 in the morning uh, when she was a teenager, lived all her life in the United States. She came when she was like 6 or 7 months old. Deported as a young teenager, 16, 17 years old, to a, couldn't even speak Spanish. Um, and she, I mean, she literally was almost killed. She literally was being chased and ran across the border and has been in jail now for the last 4 or 5 years. So how we treat the children is horrible. Not only at the border crossing, but also now you have some judges who are, and I have a couple of cases where they're saying, because you're an undocumented immigrant, you cannot provide a, a proper house for this, for this child, so we're going to put the child up for adoption and, and, and put it with a stable. So, so families are losing their children you know, to this. And of course, if, if the father or the mother are deported and the kids are at home, you know, uh, it becomes, you know, a lot of churches step in, of course, but, you know, you, you literally lose your parents. So it is just horrible what we're doing to children. And, and the sad thing is when you do that to children, in about 15 years, <laughs> that's going to come back to bite us. You know, and we're not really paying attention to that. Um, awesome, awesome lecture. I really enjoyed every, every bit of it. Um, but question now, in, 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 today's, in today's world, now that we have the consequences of, of the things that we did, uh, especially on the border, um, what should be our immigration policy now? Yeah. Now, great question. I wish I knew. I don't know. And this is what I really say. It has taken us over a century to really mess this up. 
So if we think that some comprehensive immigration reform is going to fix it, we're really being delusional. It may take another century to fix and bring justice to how we operate with Latin America. And that sounds so pessimistic and so hopeless, but that's where I am right now. I don't think there's a silver bullet. Um, what do we owe these people for a century of stealing their cheap labor and the natural resources? That's really the question we need to be wrestling with. Not why are they coming here and you know, why are they taking up our services and you know, this isn't, no. I mean, the moral question, again, I'm an ethicist, you have to forgive me. The moral question is, what obligations do we have? And, and I don't know. Maybe, you know, um, some kind of restitution. I'm not talking about giving money, but I'm talking about, you know, I believe like people who have really suffered because of these past sins, if I want to be a little religious here, um, maybe for, those, for these children to be able to go to college and therefore break the cycles of poverty by providing opportunities to be able to pay. I mean, rather than giving the 1% of this country the vast majority of the tax breaks, we could begin to flip that around a little bit and actually help the people who have suffered the most. And, and these are just ideas. For right now, what I would love to see, at the very, very least, let's stop deporting people at 3 in the morning. Very least. At the very least, at the very least, let's try to not have people go through deserts where they will die, and many do die. I mean, at the very least, Let's be humane and try to stop people dying. I mean, if we could begin there, I'll be a happy camper. I think one of the, the interesting things about the approach to food and all of these issues and sort of global politics and economics and oppression is that, you know, I have, I, I have my students in uh, Earth Ethics do a food journal and they have to trace the food for one day. And it's, it's not just, it's, it's everything. It's, palm oil, it's corn, it's coffee, it's sugar, it's diamonds, it's you know, just about everything uh, has these sort of implications. And so it's enough to make you sort of want to just go to a cave and starve yourself to death to get out of the, the chain of violence. But what, I mean, if you're not going to starve yourself to death, do you, do you have any, um, any, any suggestions for, for sort of how, to, how can we begin to, at an individual and political level, uh, begin to transform these food policies? Um, so that, you know, food actually becomes nourishment, not just for our bodies, but for the earth and human community of bodies. Yeah. You, know, the, the, you know, and again, it, it, it's really life, I mean, there's life choice decisions we can make. Like I said, my life choice decision was based mostly on health, but, you know, as an ethicist, I ended up moving now towards seeing the ethical implications of this. Um, what is it, that the average food travels 2,000 miles to get to our plate? 2,000 miles of fossil fuel being used to bring that food to our plate. So I want to have strawberries when strawberries are not in season because that, you know, that's my right as an American to have strawberries. But that means that Argentina, Argentines are not having strawberries because all their strawberries are coming here so that we can enjoy our strawberries. And coming over 2,000 miles, there's, you know, creating a tremendous um, damage to the ecology. So maybe we should learn some, some good Buddhism of living simple, of just eating what's in season and enjoy the anticipation of the next season having strawberries again. And I mentioned strawberries, but I mean, we could do that with pretty much a lot of different foods. Um, the best thing you can do, the best thing you can do for the world is not eat meat. I mean, the hamburger that you have um, raises more water to, 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 to produce a one-pound hamburger um, that, that, you know, you, you can take a bath for a whole year and, 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 and use less water. Um, so, I mean, and, and water's going to become the crime. I mean, forget about fighting wars over oil. We're going to be fighting wars over water. That's, that, I mean, that's where we're moving towards, and yet, so that we can eat meat three times a day. I mean, really, you know, we're creating an ecological disaster in the world. I mean, why do you think the Amazon forest is being destroyed? You need grazing land. That's the reason. 
You'd think that with the story of the Amazon is such a horrible thing, then we should stop eating meat. And it's great for the body, trust me, if you do. Um, so, I guess I'm a born again, you know, um, so I mean, I, I'll try to convert you if you give me an opportunity. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, those are, and these are simple, I mean, these are simple things that we can begin to do. Knowing that we'll always be into mesh with globalism, it'll always impact us, but at least we can begin to make some steps forward um, that is much friendlier to our planet. <laughs> um, I don't eat sugar. I eat, I, I use agave. Um, I use um, uh, so I don't eat that. Um, corn and bananas. I do, uh, but we try to buy you know uh, buy them as as, as um, trade friendly as possible, knowing that even that could be you know many times it's just you know. But like you said, the other alternative is to go into a cave and. Um, and, and that didn't work out for the, monarch, for the uh, monks in the first century when they tried to, you know, so how do I begin to decrease the impact of my carbon footprint? <coughs> You're asking a fabulous question. Because um, if I'm honest, I teach at a graduate school. So I mean, I'm, I'm not even talking to undergraduates. I'm talking at a very different level. So, and, and, you're, and you're absolutely right. That does us no good <laughs> at that level. I, I can give you this. Um, I, my, my, my son um, became a uh, uh, stop eating meat before I did because he watched the documentary Food Nation. And that so impacted him, and he began to see these connections, that he began this way before I did. And he's like, at the time he was uh, 20, 19, he was in high school, yeah, he was a high school kid. So I mean, he was, but, but he, he got it. So there's some great documentaries out there, some great books, that you know, are really at a level that younger folks can really appreciate. Um, the question is, how do we get this to them? Um, how do we use the material? I mean, instead of reinventing the wheel, how do we use this material? Forks Over Knives um, was one of those documentaries that literally, literally changed my life. Um, you know, so I, I think there are ways. Yeah. And of course, what I'm doing is a little bit more of the macro analysis, trying to connect everything as well. But, um, you know, you may have to go that high, you know, that micro to, to get these messages out. But yeah, great question. Well, you're part of the epistemic community, and I think that you're in a great position to influence lawmakers mm -hmm. and to influence educators. And I think that's where it has to yeah. begin. As well, yes. No, I agree. You see parallels in the investments that China is doing in Africa and South America. Mm. I'm, I'm not an expert on, on Chinese foreign trade, so I mean I can't speak with any um, expertise, that's not my area. Um, 
but I would not, I would not be, I, I think generally I could say that when we move into a neoliberal economic structure, um, I, I, I'm less concerned with the countries than I am with the corporations that may be housed in those countries. So to, you know, to think that the, you know, how can I, it's not so much the U.S., it's Ford Motor Company, it's GM, it's uh, Monsanto. It, it, those are the companies that really are creating this global economic structure and where the economies are greater than most countries. So, yes, the political part of China, no question about it, they're trying to you know, create a space for themselves, you know, and, and, I, and I can see that. But I'm more concerned with Foxconn. And, and, and the companies that are there and how they're expanding and how they're moving beyond their borders into Africa um, as well. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's less about the geopol I think, the geopolitics of, of, of countries and it's more now, I think, the geopolitics of corporations. And again, that, that China, like I said, not my way of speaking, but that's just off the top of my head. Yes, sir. Uh, this is not like a question, it's just uh, something that I noticed. Uh, I was in the Navy and everywhere we went, there was a McDonald's there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, that's not what shocked me. What shocked me is that uh, when I, you know, we went to McDonald's and we ate, but like the people from that country, like the countries that we went to, they couldn't even afford to like buy the McDonald's. So I asked the people, does that meat get imported from the States or anything? They're like, no, it's, everything is from here. And I was like, why can't any, every, everybody else afford it? You know? Absolutely. No, I think you have to, when um, we went in Indonesia, um, I, I, went in, I went to a rice field, you know, and I went out there and helped them cut some rice, and I was talking to the people. And they were making roughly $2 a day, but, you know, to cut, you know, to, to harvest the rice barefoot. Now, I had some really nice $100 sne uh, sneakers, um, uh, Nikes which a factory in Indonesia builds nice Nike sneakers, which they will never be able to afford. So here I am helping him cut rice with Nikes. He's making $2 a day. He'll never be able to afford my sneakers. And if he wants to send his kid to school, to college, he'll never be able to afford that either. So, yeah, and, and that's part of this globalization because Indonesia is not interested in making money off of him. Indonesia is interested in making money off of me. Rather, me as a tourist there, or more important, me as an American buying Nike sneakers here. And, and that's where that globalization is. So a country is not producing its goods for its own country. It's producing its goods to sell in the global market that we can afford, but they cannot. So you're right. And the, the, the person working in the McDonald's shop uh, can't afford to eat the McDonald's hamburger that they're making for you. And it's not like you, you know, it's not like you know, you have all this great money and working in the Navy. It's, I'm, I'm sure the pay wasn't all that great, but you can afford it. Yeah. And, 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 and but that's the talk. Yeah. And that's the that's the, it was a weird thing. I mean, going to Indonesia like uh, and, and other places like it. McDonald's, um, Kentucky Fried Chicken, mm -hmm. Pizza Hut, these are all fancy <coughs> restaurants. Fancy. Exactly. You go there like once a year for a special occasion. You know? That's what I noticed. <laughs> yeah. And they have like birthdays going on. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we were talking about McDonald's and uh, I read an article, I forgot where, but uh, it was talking about how people that actually work at McDonald's, the average age is like 29, and for the most part if you're 29 you probably have kids, and you really can't afford to even it's like you can't afford the food that you actually make. They can't afford McDonald's either. And if you think about it, if you can't um, afford McDonald's, what really can you eat as far as you know, trying to live a healthy lifestyle? Like you, um, I'm sure the things that you eat are more or less, I wouldn't say expensive, but they, they cost more than, right, than the average person would probably spend. Absolutely. So then you, there is no way of fixing that, you know, for like, um, I don't know, for uh, black America. How do they, you know, how do they, they have trouble eating, let alone trying to eat healthy. So, well, let's take your example, McDonald's. How much does a person make at McDonald's nowadays? Seven wage hours. Seven ten. Let's be generous. I don't want to do too much math. Let's say they're getting ten dollars an hour. Very generous, right? Ten dollars an hour. So they work what? Forty hours a week. That's four hundred dollars. Times fifty-two. 
That's uh, what? Eight carry ten. That's ten thousand eight hundred dollars a year. So if I work full time, put my nose to the grind, work full time, never take a day off, never go on vacation, I will make about four thousand dollars below the poverty level. Okay. You have to pause on that for a second. And we're talking ten dollars, a lot higher than the minimum wage. Right. That's what they want. To make. <clears throat> there is not a there's not a county in the United States where making the minimum wage you'll be able to afford an apartment. If you know most of you who are young, you know hopefully your parents didn't change your room because you'll be moving back to your room in about another three years. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not because you're lazy or you just don't have it or you're not as industrial. It is because globalization looking for the lowest possible wage to pay is in such a situation that, you know, you, you, you won't be able to support yourself. That's the reality for the vast majority of Americans. I'm just waiting for when are you guys going to go out to the streets and do something? I mean, really, your future is, is being taken over by 1% that we honor and we, we think that the greatest things in sliced cheese because they worked hard to get it. No, they didn't. They paid enough political campaign contributions, don't forget I used to be a politician, to politicians to pass laws to funnel your money in an upward direction. So, that, you know, for a minute, you won't be able to live any place, you'll be moving back to your parents' home, do something. Literally, I tell my kids, you know, go you know, overthrow, you know, study hall, you know, <laughs> do something, because it's bad. Did you hear what, um, uh, oh, what's the name from um, Google, um, uh, Steve? Um, yeah, the, the, the main guy at Google. Yeah, what's yeah. His, not Google. Um, no, you're talking about Steve. No, I'm, I'm, uh, Microsoft, I'm sorry. Steve, um, Bill Gates. Bill Gates, Bill Gates. Do you hear what Bill Gates just said the other day? Because of technology, I mean, the government's going to have to get on its hands and knees and beg corporations to hire people on minimum wage and not charge them any taxes whatsoever, so people could at least have jobs. That's the future. That's what globalization has done. What the poverty that we have created in Latin America and in Indonesia by multinational corporations is now coming home to roost because corporations don't care about national boundaries. They're looking. We used to be a manufacturing company, a country. You know, until 1973, work at a factory, you're making about, in today's dollars, about $25 an hour. We've changed into a service market, which pays, of course, minimum wage. So before, you needed three, you needed three people now to do, make the same amount of money that you used to make at Ford. You used to be able to graduate from high school and get a job and support a family. The golden age, 1950s, okay? Dad worked, forget sexism and forget racism for a second, just put that on the side. But dad could work and support mom who stayed at home with the kids and go on vacation and put the kids through college. The reason why women enter the workplace is not because we got enlightened and we said, oh, women are equal to men. It's because in the 70s, you needed women to also work to maintain the same level of, um, the same level of, of, of I mean, income. So women is in the marketplace. So now, you know, that's the reason. And of course, because they're inferior, they only get paid at that time 50 cents for the same um, dollar that a man made. Today, things have improved and making 70 cents for every dollar that a man makes. So again, you should be protesting that, doing something about that. Okay, so, so that was during the 70s. <laughs> then what ends up happening is that by the 80s, even with both people working, that's not enough, so you have to get a third job. Someone has to moonlight. So you now have two people doing three or four jobs, okay? Then by the time we get to the tenth, to, 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 to the zeros, whatever you call this last decade, um, you know, that's not enough. So you have to use your equity to get you over those humps. And we saw how great that worked in 2008 when the bubble crashed and everybody lost everything. So now what we're seeing is that you have generational generations living in one house, people all coming to live in one house. You know, um, so, so the economy is radically changing and we're not even realizing it 
Um, and we're becoming literally a third world nation economically. Do something. <laughs> Can you back up before that? What was, what was the, the majority of our economy was what though? Before World War or before World War II? When we weren't in agriculture. Oh, yeah. So Sixty percent of us. Right. And yeah. So we're, I think we're headed back that way because there's really no other option. But I, I wish we could, but now you have Monsanto who controls so much of the agricultural well, that, that the f small farmer cannot come back. And even if they did come back, they have to buy the seed from Monsanto that are genetically modified that, you know, that they basically sell themselves to. So, so while I agree, it would be great if we could just all go back and have our little plot of land and grow our own food, it, it's just becoming almost impossible because so, of... But, so for me, that's the front line of the fight, though, right? Like, you're asking about what we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're right. When St. Francis sanctify yourself, you sanctify society. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if we all make that decision, and that's where we fight, then that's, I mean, that's the way I see it. I don't no, and, and and by all means, you it's we'll your generation. You have to fight it the way you think. Inflated, inflated top educated yeah. group that mm -hmm. has no way to find jobs because of what you're talking about right. in terms of creative destruction, jobs going abroad. And I, I don't see any other way forward. But. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but it depends on you know, like, do I want to do I want to work in a field all day? This uh, in, in a shameless act of self-promotion, um, I just <laughs> I just published a book that came out last month called uh, "Doing Christian Ethics from the Margins," uh, uh, the second edition. The first edition is ten years old. The second edition, in where I go into great detail on how these corporations are interlocked with, with politics, there's a chapter on political contributions, a chapter on poverty, national poverty, local poverty. So I mean, it, you know, the, the, the numbers I've been throwing off on the top of my head, if you actually want to see the numbers, if you actually want to see the graphs, if you actually want to see the, the documentation, it's all in that book. I want to just uh, uh, sort of start drawing this to a close, but I have one question to sort of end on. Um, uh, you do teach at Isla School of Theology, and you did get an MDiv from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and you did do a PhD in social ethics at Temple with uh, in the religious studies faculty. So I'm wondering, uh, you, you haven't said much about how religion plays mm -hmm. into into this uh, analysis of economics and, and food politics, and how what 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 about religion sort of led you to this sort of analysis? Um. Some of the books you mentioned there um, are written about liberation theology. I, I am a liberation theologian. Uh, for those who may not know what that means, um, I take the biblical text radically that the purpose of, of, of the biblical text is a book written for the poor. It's a book written for the poor to understand. What has happened is that the rich have learned how to read the book and use it to justify their power and their privilege. So what I'm trying to do in the, in the work I do in the, uh, as a religious scholar is recapture these teachings. So when Jesus says a rich man does not enter into the kingdom of heaven, I take that literally. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, okay. I, you know, I, I get that. You know, uh, but then what we do is we spiritualize it. Oh no, he was meaning that. You know, and from. so it, 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 it's a type of theology that begins with the poor, that's the starting point, um, the oppress. Um, and, and for me, the oppress are people who are oppressed economically, uh, racially, gender-wise, uh, sexual identity, um, all forms of oppression. And I begin with understanding who God is according to them. Now, as a Christian, I, I lean towards uh, the Christian faith, but I do this with Muslims, I do this with Buddhists, I do this with Hindus, I do this with humanists. I mean, I really could care less what religion you are or no religion. What is it, the, what's the core of your faith, of your, of your moral being, and what is that based on? And then from there, in these conversations, we work together to bring about justice. Because when I'm working for justice, and my Muslim friend is working for justice, we are closer in faith than other Christians um, in my own field. Uh, because I believe that the work for justice is the core of all these religions. 
So I'm not trying to water down my faith. I'm just saying, you know, because of my faith, I do this work of justice. And I find fellow walkers with me who are of other faith traditions or no faith traditions. So that's how that all connects. Okay? Well, um, so 